In our first episode of the ISP series, we found out about some of the challenges we would face when starting our own ISP, as well as the fascinating history of X-Mission, one of the first commercial ISPs. Several viewers left comments mentioning ISPs like Kaiwan out of Los Angeles, which was actually run out of a house. Then a comment from one of the first employees at Icons in New Zealand. And another about the little garden in San Francisco that started all the way back in 1990. And there were countless others. This goes to show just how rich the history is of this time period, and why we think it is so important to preserve. But we left on a cliffhanger, with a Sunspark Classic not powering on. Before we jump into attempting to repair it though, we wanted to learn a little bit about what exactly the Spark Classic is. We know it's a workstation and that it was made by Sun, but why was it made and who actually used it? In 1989, Sun formed the Entry Systems Group and their mission was to create a low cost, network capable workstation to capture the rapidly increasing demand. In the early 90s, IBM compatible PCs and Macs weren't viewed as serious hardware for businesses or research institutions which were the traditional market for workstations and servers. This arena was dominated by contenders like Sun, IBM, HP, DEC, and so on. But as more and more businesses began wanting to connect to the internet while simultaneously equipping more and more employees with computers, there was a demand for a low-cost, mass-produced solution. And this is what the Spark Classic was intended to deliver. It was part of Sun Microsystems' Sun 4 lineup. Their earlier models, Sun 1 through 3, were released from 1982 to 1985 and were based on Motorola 68K processors. But the Sun 4 in 1987 introduced the legendary Spark processor. This was a risk-based processor built from the ground up for Sun systems. The Spark Classic also used the Spark processor, but it housed the newly developed MicroSpark. Clocked at 50 MHz, it had a slightly higher MIPS or million instructions per second rating of 59 compared to a 486DX266 MHz processor, which clocked in at 55 MIPS, and it did this in a much smaller physical package. And the Spark Classic would run Sun's new operating system at the time, Solaris version 2.1. The Spark Classic was touted as being the workstation for the masses, and Sun ultimately sold more than 100,000 units during the first year of production. There were other versions of the Classic released as well, like the Spark Station LX meant to target the computer graphics user, as well as a server edition that featured a whopping one gigabyte hard drive. For us though, the most remarkable detail about the system is its footprint, which is only around 10 inches square. Commonly referred to as the lunchbox form factor, it's small and well packaged, and compared to the PCs of the day, it probably looked cutting edge at the time. And it seems like the perfect solution for a small ISP in the early 90s. But enough history, let's see if we can get it working so we can finally experience what this system has to offer. Our Spark Classic does not power on. We do hear a relay click, but it shuts off immediately. We were able to get the system powered on for a short while when we first obtained it, so we know it was working relatively recently. So let's open it up and see what's going on. The case splits apart into two halves and it makes for easy access. It is obvious Sun was on top of their engineering game as everything is packaged and laid out well without much wasted space. It's pretty amazing that this system is more or less equivalent to a 486 PC of the day, except in a much smaller footprint. And here's our MicroSpark processor protected under this cover. You may have noticed there's no RAM installed currently, but that's okay. Unlike a typical PC, this system can boot off of its firmware without any RAM modules present. We'll first check out the power supply. We can see that we are getting the standby voltage of 5 volts. So this indicates that the primary side of the power supply is most likely intact, as well as the standby portion of the secondary side. So from here, we'll go ahead and take the power supply out as well as the motherboard so we can properly test everything on the bench.
The supply is made by FDK and the model number is PEX643-30. It's rated for 70 watts continuous output and up to 15 seconds of 105.2 watts of output. We can see we also have a 5, 12, and negative 12 volt output, similar to what we'd expect from a standard PC power supply, except there's no 3.3 volt output here. It took a little bit of fiddling, but the case for the power supply just sort of snaps apart after a screw on the top is removed. The supply is pretty dirty. Assuming we can get this repaired, it's going to require a major cleanup. We desoldered the AC power inlet and we're finally able to completely remove the PCB. It definitely looks like some of these caps have failed and some electrolyte has been leaking out onto the surrounding components. Let's test the ESR of some of these caps. An ESR of over 40 ohms means the cap has failed. And here's the bad capacitor that we're replacing. After getting a few new caps soldered in, we're ready to see if we've brought this power supply back from the dead. We haven't. The nice thing about something like this power supply though, is that many of these components are easily replaceable, either with identical parts or modern equivalents, except for things like the transformers. We should be able to rebuild it into working condition. The same of course cannot be said for the motherboard, which has rare, hard to find components, but luckily that seems to be intact. First things first, the board needs to be cleaned in the ultrasonic cleaner but we need to remove the components we don't want exposed to the cleaning liquid. This also gives us a chance to check for any more damage or failures. With the components removed, we can see there is a lot of corrosion and electrolyte from the failed capacitors. 
Let's see if we can pull out a miracle and get the supply repaired. We'll first run the board through the ultrasonic cleaner. After cleaning, the board is looking so much better. The top layer of the PCB has started to wear away, exposing some of the substrate. And we did get some solder mask flaking off on the copper side, which is not uncommon on some of these older boards. We can address this later and it won't be an issue, so we can go forward with replacing all of the caps and reinstalling all of the components. The devices mounted on the heat sinks receive new Wakefield phase change thermal interface pads, which do not require heat sink compound. And here we're just ensuring that the device is electrically isolated from the heat sink. And here's the finished board. We installed a variety of Panasonic FR and FS series capacitors in many locations, which are ideal for many parts of power supply circuits. We also replaced the primary relay along with a micro relay on the secondary side. The copper heat sinks look beautiful now as well. With any luck, the supply will be back to working condition. So let's test it out to see what we get. The fan isn't connected here, but we do see the power consumption increase to 280 milliamps. That's a good sign, but let's check our voltage outputs. Our 5 volt regulation could be better, but this is only around 4% deviation, so it should be okay. The positive 12 and negative 12 look solid. With that done and the power supply now working, we can replace the fan. We simply cut and splice the old wires and connector over to the new fan. The power supply chassis was cleaned as well, and now we can reassemble.
The only item to address on the motherboard is the NV or non-volatile RAM. The NV RAM contains our RTC or real-time clock and stores the MAC address as well as a few other values. It is powered by a lithium backup battery, and that is long dead. There are two ways to correct this. We can either manually remove the top portion of the NV RAM where the battery resides and solder in an adapter board that contains a crystal and a standard coin cell battery. The other option is to replace the entire module itself. There are pros and cons to each method, but we ultimately opted for the latter. Now let's take apart our floppy drive and give that a good cleaning as well. This is a Sony MP-F17W-P1. No, sorry, this has actually been converted to the P2, which is better? The mechanism feels and sounds a little dull, so we'll do a tear down, clean, and re-lubricate all the moving parts. The mechanical action of the drive is nice and smooth now. The case will also need some repair. The plastic is covered in grime and dust. The metal inserts have some corrosion and rust, so that will need to be removed. And this wouldn't be a serial port restoration without a dead bug. But we also found these initials. Maybe the person who assembled the system? Leave us a comment if you happen to know UMG. There's an obvious small chip on the corner of the case as well, so let's see if we can repair that. First, we made a straight cut to make the chip a uniform shape. From there, we can take some measurements and design a replacement piece using Fusion 360.
Once that is 3D printed, we can use a gap filling super glue to adhere that into place. From there, we sand it to blend it into the surrounding plastic as much as possible. Paint and texture matching was a little tricky for the damaged corner, but it was an overall successful repair. It blends in okay. The edge structure was replicated so the case can close normally. The rust was removed from the metal shielding. And finally, the entire case was thoroughly cleaned and it cleaned up way better than we were expecting. With everything done, sit back and relax while we get the Spark Classic reassembled. With the rebuild finished, we can now fully appreciate the transformation this system has gone through. It arrived to us in poor shape with a broken case, it was covered in grime, and it wasn't even able to power on. But now is the big moment when we get to see if all of our hard work has paid off.
we're booting into what's called the Open Boot firmware, which is embedded software on the motherboard. We don't have an operating system installed yet, but this firmware will allow us to set up the necessary prerequisites, and we'll also get to see if our hardware checks out okay. We've reached the OK prompt, which is great because that means we've successfully booted from the firmware. As expected though, due to our new NVRAM chip, we see a message indicating ID prom contents are invalid, and the host ID and ethernet address are both shown as all fives. We will now need to program these values before continuing on. Any Sun system from this era is going to have the same problem, so there are several great resources online and some YouTube videos that show this process more in depth. We consulted with Mark Henderson's FAQ to help us determine what commands were needed to get the NVRAM programmed with the correct values. It seems a bit overwhelming at first, but we eventually got the right commands entered to set the host ID, the machine type, the ethernet address, the date of manufacture, and the ID prom checksum. Once those are in place, then we can run the reset command. We now see an ethernet address, a host ID, and no ID prom error. And we're also seeing this timeout waiting for an ARP packet. So that seems to indicate it's trying to netboot. So let's move on to getting that set up. As we did on our Macintosh Classic 2 project earlier this year, we'll be using a Zulu SCSI drive in the Spark Classic. We prepared a new SD card by creating a text file. The Zulu SCSI firmware interprets the name of the text file, and in this case, we'll create a 2GB hard disk image at SCSI ID3. We're specifying ID3 because that was the default SCSI ID that Sun used for the system's boot hard drive. We unfortunately don't have the optional external SCSI CD-ROM drive for the Classic, so we'll be attempting to install Solaris over the network. Fortunately, network-based installs were pretty common for Solaris, and we found several guides online. At first, we thought about trying to do the network install from a Linux server, but the more we read, it seemed like it would just be easier on our first attempt to do the install from a Solaris host. Using a copy from archive.org, we installed an x86 build of Solaris 8 in a virtual machine to use as our install server. The first step is to attach the CD-ROM or copy the full contents of the CD-ROM to a directory. And note there are some hidden dot files in the root of the CD-ROM that are important for the install. From the copied contents, we ran the setup install server script from the tools directory. With that done, we now want to run the add install client script. We do need to specify some parameters here after adding our IP and host name to the host file. Next, we check and confirm we have the tftp daemon enabled in the inetd.conf file. And we also have the boot parameters daemon service running. So with any luck, our Spark Classic should be able to boot from the network. After sending a break command, we can then issue the boot net tpe command. We're intentionally specifying the twisted pair ethernet port with this command, as the classic has an AUI port in addition to the RJ45. We did see some lost carrier errors, but we eventually receive an IP address via RARP, the reverse address resolution protocol, which was used prior to DHCP. And if you ever find yourself troubleshooting a Sun network boot, you can use the command snoop on the boot server. It shows packets on the network so you can get a better idea of what's going on. And we finally made it to the Solaris installer.
Here, since we are using a serial terminal, we can hit escape plus the number two instead of F2 to continue. And now we'll just choose other because we're not planning to use NIS. This is a rather puzzling question to ask in the modern era of TCP IP, but yes, we are part of a subnet. And we're obviously not doing an upgrade, so we'll hit F4 to continue. We're going to select the developer system support since we want to be able to compile software. So hopefully that will include the C compiler and related tools. The installer recognized our disk, and this is because we already put a sun label on it with the format command. This is a requirement if you're installing to a new disk. And here we go. This whole installation process ends up taking over an hour. And here we can see that the patch packages are being applied to our system. The install is finally complete. Now we can reboot and for the first time boot into Solaris 2.6 and have a fully operational system. And now we can set our root password. This version of Solaris only supports a maximum of eight total characters for the password. Simpler times back then. We did it. We're now logged into a fully restored SunSpark Classic, and we have a fresh install of Solaris 2.6, ready to take all of us on a journey to the early internet. And as you can see, our ping to google.com fails because the system isn't set up yet to use DNS. But the good news is that we can ping out to the internet, so our system is online. By default, Solaris only allows the root user to log into the system console, so let's add a user. Unlike a modern Linux distribution, adding a user requires a few commands. We're creating the user's account with the corn shell or KSH, and we need to specify and make a home directory since that isn't done automatically, and of course, set the password. We can now successfully log in with Telnet over the network. We're using Telnet because SSH was not included in Solaris until the release of Solaris 9 in 2002. The big question remains though, can we use the Spark Classic as an internet host and dial in with a modem like the early X mission days? But first things first, we'll need to get a modem connected. Pete Ashdown used a serial expander card on the original Spark Classic to connect modems. We found two of these options. Sun made a serial parallel controller that enabled eight serial ports through an expansion card. 
And then there was a third party option called Magma, which offered a few sizes of serial port expanders for some workstations. We couldn't find either of these hardware options available, so we're gonna use the serial ports built in to the Spark Classic. Sun actually made a Y splitter cable that exposes two discrete serial ports from the DB25 connector. This would be perfect to keep the first serial port open for console access, and then use the second serial port for a dial-in modem. If you connect a modem and set it to auto answer mode, you can actually dial in to get remote console access. Ashdown mentioned that he made use of this functionality. There was a really bad snowstorm in Salt Lake City and I had to walk because the roads were so bad, I had to walk from my apartment to where the equipment was located through three feet of snow. And when I got to the little closet I was renting, I was looking at the back of the sun and realizing that there is a serial console that could reboot the entire computer and access the computer when it had crashed that I could hook to a modem. And that was a revelation for me. I was like, holy crap, I don't need to walk through the snow. I can do this all remotely. And so um, that was a really nice feature of the Suns back then is that you had this default serial console that always worked. To take advantage of this, we could make a Y cable, but since we don't really need serial console access now, we instead decided just to make a quick custom assembly to connect to the second serial port. It's a bit ugly, but it works. We are tapping into serial port B pins and connecting them to the DB25 connector on our modem. We found some guides online to configure Solaris 2.6 for inbound modem access. With that set up, we're now going to try it out from our Packard Bell running Windows 95. This is it, the serial port ISP has its first dial-up user. We can now log in and get to a Unix prompt just as people would have done in the early 90s. From here, we can explore the wonders of the internet using tools like links to connect to our favorite Gopher sites. What a journey this has been, and we're only just getting started. Now that our Spark Classic is online and usable, we'll also be letting our Patreon supporters log in via Telnet, so they too can enjoy all of the early internet protocols and relive the early 90s ISP experience. On our next episode, we will be delving into the world of T1s, routing, and setting up the high-speed pipeline to the information superhighway. Until then, thanks for watching The Serial Port, and we'll see you again next time.